uh, consisting of faculty, a few faculty and students, and you can ask questions on the panel along with any issues that you might have. And then we'll break, and there are a number of other faculty who also come this evening, and you can speak <laughs> to members of the panel, myself, the other faculty members, to, to our student representative, and um, also to folks from student services. If there, you have any questions that we're not able to answer, uh, or you'd like to be put in touch with any other faculty member, you just got to write to me, and I will create the contact for you if I can. Okay. But to introduce the PhD program, my uh, esteemed colleague, Pericles Andritsos, who's a data scientist, um, well, great sport. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am very pleased, and I'm, uh, I'm an assistant professor here. Uh, I'd like to give you uh, the complete introduction to, to the program, and uh, we can answer a lot of questions right after, right? So, uh, the faculty of information doctoral program. So you are, you know that, in one of the top universities in the world. Uh, you uh, are in the faculty that is, is said to be the fastest growing, like in terms of uh, students and uh, faculty members, I believe. We do have two, uh, let's say, uh, sister uh, faculties that we work with uh, at the, the other two campuses at the University of Toronto, in Mississauga and, and Scarborough, with uh, different areas of expertise. Our PhD program was established actually in 1971, and the first graduates uh, came out of the program in 1974. So when I was being born, people were graduating. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, uh, we do have several areas of research. Maybe you have looked at them, but I will briefly mention. And see, we'll be more than happy to answer questions about the concentration later. Critical information policy studies. I don't know if Mark will be able to answer questions about that. Mark Rado is, uh, is sitting in the audience and will be in the panel. Cultural heritage, Matt or Seus. Uh, information systems and design. I wear two hats, so I have that hat as well in my wardrobe. Uh, knowledge management and information management, library and information science, media technology and culture, and philosophy of information. Right? Uh, so there are uh, a number of faculty members. Uh, here that you could find, actually, uh, I have internet, so I visited the pages. You can look at all of us, and you can look at what each one of us is doing uh, in more detail. You could find also the contact information of professors that you would be interested in working with or, or learning more about their research expertise. So we uh, have made all the efforts to have a complete list. I believe everybody is here. Uh, and at the same time, you can also see uh, doctoral profiles. So you can see the profiles of doctoral students uh, right in this list. You could also figure out who the supervisor is and what they're working on. Right? Hopefully, you will be in this list one day. Uh, admissions. Now I pass the token to Sherry. Now that you're so much more interested in our program, we're going to look through the steps that you will take to apply to us. Uh, application, everything is completely online. Uh, it's ready to open, it's ready to go. Uh, the deadline for us to receive everything will be January 15th. So these are the components that we're going to be looking at, obviously, your academic history. Uh, we're looking for a minimum of an A minus, CV, uh, anything about your education, work experience, paid, unpaid, any relevant personal experience, 
uh, any work uh, that she has done before, how uh, any awards, scholarships, grants, bursaries that you might have received before, all that wonderful stuff that paints a really good picture about yourself should go up there. <coughs> research statement. What research are you interested in? What is the direction that you want to go in? Great. Uh, it will be really good for us to know. Um, and you should probably take a look at our faculty website, all the profiles that Bertha showed you just now. Um, you want to kind of figure out if there is someone in the faculty that is that has research that is aligned with your own interests. Right? You want to be able to find someone that can actually guide you during your doctoral period with us. Writing example. Uh, a thesis that you have done before, uh, any publications you might have made, a, a book chapter, an article that you have published or sent through publication, um, it should have about 5,000 to 10,000 words. Three academic references, someone that can speak to your research competence. Uh, we are looking for academic reference. However, if you have been out of school for more than five years, uh, you can make working sense, uh, one of the references could be a work reference. Uh, we should avoid going and asking for references from previous TAs. Uh, it should be somewhat a faculty member that you have worked with previously. And in English proficiency, if applicable, uh, if you have received a previous bachelor's, master's degree uh, in an institution where English is a teaching medium, that's nothing for you to worry about. If English is your first language, that's nothing to worry about as well. Any questions so far? Funding, something I'm sure everyone is very interested in. Uh, funding for years one to four, just generally, uh, guaranteed a minimum funding of 17500 per year. So that would include tuition fees uh, and some living allowances. Students in the PhD program are encouraged, highly encouraged, to apply for the various government external awards. Uh, they will make you feel good uh, when you receive shirt referral, uh, OGS, various other external awards uh, that our students usually compete for. Um, there's faculty scholarships, there's TA ship, RA ship. Once we go into the fifth year, uh, you are only covered for tuition and fees only. Uh, so that obviously reduces the amount of funding that is available to you. <coughs> Just uh, some idea. Uh, we recently reached out to some of our graduates to look at what are some of the really cool jobs that they are doing since graduation. Uh, so the bigger the word, uh, the more the number of uh, graduates that has such a title, uh, post-graduation, assistant professor, associate professor, director, researcher, uh, <coughs> policy analysts, etc. And these are some of the cool places that they end up working in. University of Toronto, you being a graduate from here, we do like to hire you back. Uh, Ryerson, University of Alberta, Local Gloria. Um, I think we also have a couple of graduates that started up their own company, so that's really cool. Startup companies are on the rise, um, and of course, you'll be working, uh, some of the graduates work in areas that is involved in research, policies, analysts, etc. Okay. Um, any questions with regards to the admission process? Okay, so we're going into our faculty panel. If I can invite our faculty members and Haley, our students, up to the front. <laughs> So just before you even start the questions, I want to just pick up with one one point that um, Sherry was making when she was talking about the documentation you need to prepare. 
Obviously, your grades are important. Obviously, your CV is important. The research, um, your, your research paper, we look at very closely to see how well you write, the way you can argue a case. But the research statement is the single most important document in your portfolio. We look at that to judge whether or not you've actually thought about the kinds of research you could do in our faculty. Whether you've thought about the kinds of faculty members you might work with. Whether you've actually reached out to them before and discussed your potential research with them. That's really important for a couple of reasons. One, we'd like to get a sense to understand what you're getting into when you start a PhD. Two, we'd like to know that you've actually thought about the kinds of people you can work with in the directions that they think research is going in. Okay. And I suggest that you, after you write it, you get someone else to read it before you send it in. Um, it's, no, it's no harm to ask a friend to read something do take that research statement very, very seriously. Okay. I don't think they want to add anything about that. The, the, yeah, Christine is. Hi, I'm Christine. I work with Student Services, and um, I support PhD students in as many ways as I can. So I'm just going to ask the panel here to some questions, and then we can open it up afterwards. Okay. So um, if you guys don't mind introducing yourself and then talking briefly about your academic background and research interest. Thank you. I go into Christine before because I know she has a question about the research thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm Pericles again, and <clears throat> I, uh, I have a background in engineering. Uh, and then I came to Canada and I did my master's and my PhD in computer science down the road here at U of T. I have, uh, I have been uh, teaching and doing um, uh, industrial work uh, since I finished, both here in Canada and in Europe. I went to Europe and all of, every time I went, I came back to Canada. <laughs> anyway, so I, I am in the faculty for a few years now. And, and my expertise is in data analytics, data science, databases, and all this new cool stuff that when I finished in 2005 was terrible. I am Fiorella Tuscanini. I'm a PhD student in I come from Italy and I joined the faculty in 2010, this faculty. Uh, I have been in the field, so as a practitioner, artist, records manager for many years. I only decided to do a PhD when I was 37. And uh, I did my PhD at UBC. And uh, so I, I got in 2009, and then in 2010, I am right here as, as an assistant professor. So I was very lucky. <laughs> I can tell you more. Uh, so I'm Matt Leto. I, um got a bachelor's degree in theater from the University of California, Santa Cruz, many, many years ago, um, but was involved in early uh, home computing in, southern, uh, in Central California uh, through the 70s and 80s, and returned to it in the 90s when I worked professionally for a number of digital telephony companies. Um, in 96, I decided to go back to school, and I started a PhD in 97 at the University of California, San Diego, in the communication faculty there, that uh, at that time also was very highly aligned with the science and technology studies, or STS faculty. Uh, and I completed my PhD in 2003, studying the uh, development of open source software, specifically the Linux operating system. Um, I then went to Europe uh, and worked as a researcher for the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences for five years. Uh, and then one year at the University of Umeå in northern Sweden, and I came here to uh, University of Toronto in 2008. Um, my research is primarily on um, basically emergent digital systems, and I study those systems from a critical perspective. Uh, my work uh, engages in a kind of a research practice I call critical making, where I try to link um, practices of 
uh, technical developments and social and uh, critical theoretical analysis. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Haley. I'm a first year PhD student here, uh, so I just started several months ago. Uh, I was right where you were not that long ago. Uh, I So I'm from the States, I was born and raised in Tennessee. Uh, so if you have questions, I don't know if this would apply to any of you since you're all here in person, but if you do have questions about being an international student, we can chat about that, possibly. Um, I did a master's degree at Washington, George Washington University in DC, where I lived for six years. Uh, I finished that almost four years ago now, uh, in anthropology and museum studies. And uh, in the interim time, I worked for three years as a digitization specialist at the Smithsonian uh, in the Department of Anthropology. Um, uh, and now I'm researching how uh, museums are supporting the use of virtual reality technology um, uh, in collaboration with indigenous communities to do cultural and language uh, Revitalization of preservation work. So I'm, um, thank you. I'm Seamus Ross, and I completed my PhD a very long time ago. What year, Seamus? What year was that? <laughs> it was 1991. That wasn't that long. But it, I, I actually took my first computing course 50 years ago this year. When I was 11 years old, I went to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia um, for. 12 Saturdays to uh, learn how to program. My mother had a lot of foresight. Um, I completed my PhD in anthropology and geography, actually, and specifically in knowledge representation and archaeology. Uh, and I do research now predominantly on long term preservation of digital materials. And so. Okay. Thank you. Next question What traits, attitudes, or habits do you think the ideal PhD student brings up on the uh, Okay. So, um, I think what I, what I would like to have in a PhD student is, um, is focus and uh, openness to new ideas. Um, maybe also patience and, and uh, yeah, ability to to cope with the isolation, <laughs> in the sense that you have to work by yourself a lot. So you have to think and write. And I hear from our PhD students that you you spend a lot of time by yourself, running, thinking, and writing, and. and I, this is also my, my story. When I went to BBC, I, I just work alone. It, it's not nice. I mean, it's, uh, you will have a call. But uh, this type of work, so the writing, is something that you mostly do by yourself. <laughs> so I think it's important to know. And then I, I will pass the sure. microphone. Sure. Um, I think, you know, I, I was talking with Christine about this earlier, you know, students, there's, there's two, there's two types of people in the world now, there's, there's, uh, uh, we, we often see two types of um, research letters, we put it that way, come in to us. One is a fairly um, general statement, I have these general interests. Uh, I think this is kind of interesting and I'd like to think more about this. We tend to be like, oh, okay, well, maybe we need more specificity, as you might imagine. But the, the, there's another one that is kind of equally problematic, um, which is the student that comes in and says, this is the project that I'm going to do. I have got everything mapped out for the next four years. Uh, I'm going to study this, I'm going to study this, I'm going to study this, these are the authors, I think I must put. That actually raises more red flags for me, because what it underestimates is the fact that a PhD is fundamentally about intellectual change. And what a student brings to the table and what they think of as important the day they come into the PhD is probably not, if it's a successful PhD, where what they what it, what it is really going to be about at the end. And so I guess uh, what I the trait that that I think of as most important 
is a kind of intellectual flexibility. The, but it's also focused. It doesn't mean you kind of go wherever your ideas take you, but it means that you have a kind of a openness, like you said, Fiorella, and a kind of, a, I would say, almost a kind of an intellectual bravery. The capacity to leave what you know and to journey out in novel directions. Because that's ultimately really, it, that capacity rewards you in two different ways. One way it rewards you in is in keeping your own love for what you're doing. To, to, be, to be able to sustain this intellectual journey requires that you don't get bored of your own intellectual journey, right? So that's one thing that, that bravery provides, I think. And the other is, is it, it, um, it rewards you because you go in places that other people aren't going. And ultimately, that's what creates a distinguished outcome for a PhD student. By a show of hands, who here has or will soon have a master's degree? Most people. Keep your hand raised if it's in a discipline that's not information studies. Okay. Um, it's been a bit of a journey for me coming into a new discipline um, from anthropology. And I have found that, that one of the things that has helped the most is sort of having a, a sort of like a commitment to collaboration with my cohort mates and the other PhD students in the program, um, not just an openness to collaborating, but sort of an active dedication to working with other people and learning from what they've done. Because most of my cohort <clears throat> are information scientists already, uh, and I'm not. Um, and so the learning curve has been great in a lot of ways. Um, but we've had some incredibly productive conversations and engagements that I, I like. I decided to come to an information studies program for that reason exactly because I didn't want to stick sort of my real house, I needed to get outside of that. Um, so even if you are already an information scientist, and this is sort of like, you're just continuing on something that you're already working on, there are gonna be other people in your cohort who bring so much else to the table, and you've gotta be really proactive about getting them to the table and, and having a reciprocal relationship with them. Um, so I think that's really what I would say is super valuable. to me, I'm not sure. Uh, so one of the things that I would like to point out is that this is something that you do once in your life. I haven't met a lot of people who have two PhDs, for example. So one of the things that I would like to see in a PhD student, or what I try to do is make that your life. Um, so this is going to be something that will stigmatize you for the rest of, the, of, of your life. There is absolutely no way, and I have seen in everyone who has a PhD what they say, yeah, whoever has a PhD is a little bit crazy. Yes, it is. Like, we are a little bit crazy. Especially if you do data science and computer science stuff, you yeah, you will have to find nice acronyms to name your papers and, and, and things like that. Uh, so one of, of, of beyond making that your life is, uh, so if I wanted to work on something new, I would go out there and do another PhD, right? So. Why do I say that? I would like to learn from you. So be ready to become, <coughs> except for good researchers, good like when you, you read what uh, what needs to be read, you you program and you do whatever is needed. But be ready <coughs> to to come back to us and teach us what what you've learned. There is guidance on the plate. Uh, there is experience on the plate from our side, but. Uh, the, the, the devil is in the details, right? So when what I expect from my PhD students is to come to my office and every single time that I see them, learn something new. And kind of through experience and, and judgment, tell them, yeah, that, that is probably not the right way to do it. There's something else. So make that your life and, and, and teach us stuff. On top of whatever was said before. So I just say, that there are four, four things that I think you have to look for. These are all great points, and th these four things summarize some of the things that we've heard. One is flexibility. Intellectual flexibility is fundamental. Second thing is absolute dedication. Third thing is perseverance. You're gonna, you're gonna have to keep your head down 
And finally, and this is probably um, the hardest thing to see when you don't, when you start this program, when you start any PhD program, you cannot see the finish line. You don't understand all the steps you need to go through. Your first required courses, your qualifying exams, your thesis proposal, your thesis your research ethics, then the actual writing of the thesis. You can't see this, but you need to be both tactical and strategic. You have to think from the beginning to the end about how you're going to make this process work. And so that combined with intellectual flexibility, dedication, and perseverance will really get you through. Thank you for those insights. Um, this goes back to what she was talking about before. So part of the application process is sorry, the creation. Sorry, sorry. Can you just be speaking louder? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part, hold, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Watching that line. Part of the application process is the creation of a research statement. What makes a statement catch your eye? Maybe I'll start. Um, I mean, there's some, some things that kind of reiterate what we've already said. I, I think one is that you've done your homework, that you're not just speaking about something that you think is interesting, but that you've attempted to research that a bit, that you've dug in just in some detail to like what has already been done on that topic. At least that you've tried that. It's not that you've done a full research project necessarily on that topic, but that you're not just speaking from your own opinion, but that you're, you're trying to bring academic literature into the page. That's one thing that I always like to see in a research statement. The other thing I like to see is that a person has considered their fit, their explicit fit with the faculty. Uh, you know, the PhD the acceptance process is not simply about us grading you or something, like from the top to the bottom. It's actually about finding people that we think we can provide value to. Uh, as well. And so a lot of that is about, well, do we have the internal resources, the intellectual resources, to support the kind of work that you want to engage in? And the best way for, for us to, to make that happen, or to tell if that's actually accurate, is for you to try to make that fit in your research data. So the more you can kind of do that, the better, it, the, the easier it is for us to evaluate how well you're going you're gonna to fit. And then, of course, the last thing I think just reiterates what I already said, which is that, that you don't have an overly structured project that, that, that we would then get the sense that you, you are immovable from that thing that you actually want to do. Because we know that that's not actually what you're going to do. We're going to do something that's probably a change from that original project. So um, most statements uh, are like grand projects. Right? You start with the idea that you want to discover something that nobody before you thought about, or you want to revolutionize, you know, change the world of archives, speaking about my discipline. You may start by saying this, but try also to like show that you take an angle that is yours. So you you may have this like large broad idea and we will let you know later that it's too much, that you cannot, you have to narrow it down. So you don't have to do this narrowing down from the beginning. The statement could be kind of grand. But what I look into this big plan is a specific angle, something that tells me that you have an idea and that I can take to help you shape your project in something feasible in four, five years maximum. Uh, so that I, I see, I, I want to see some material that makes me think, oh, yeah, <coughs> he or she thought about something new and is bringing some new literature or a, an idea from another field. I like interdisciplinary work. So if you show me that in your huge, big project, you have 
special perspective. This is for me very, it's a sign that maybe we can work together. And of course, if I see the word archives, that's something that makes me smile. <laughs> So, oh, if I see my name, <laughs> yeah, so you have to look at the profiles and see if uh, there is one or two or three uh, faculty members that whose research aligns with your ideas, right? You don't have to find just one, but if there is just one that really is you, just contact this person before and right? You can, you can contact us and say, I see that you are doing research my case on information culture, I'm interested in that area. And so you start the conversation offline somehow. Can I mention something on this that maybe Seamus wants to say? So feel free to, I think it's great to contact faculty members. We all like that, to be contacted about it. Uh, what I don't like personally, and I think is, I don't know how other people feel about it, I don't like being asked to review your research statement though. Don't ask me to do that. Like, because the, in a way, it's kind of like asking me to do work for you that you should you do yourself. Are we going to give you a guarantee? Oh, yes, I think this is an A plus research statement. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not getting accepted. You know, it kind of creates this weird dilemma in it. Um, I'm happy to talk about the topics of it, but I don't want to review the research statement. Sure. Um, Okay, so my attempt to someone who recently wrote one of these statements. Um, good enough, I guess. Um, it was excellent. I remember it very well. Actually. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, my, so first of all, I think it all comes down to sort of your motivation, <laughs> like not to get too existential about it, but your motivation in applying for PhD programs is in the first place. Um, I did so because I felt like I had a question that needed to be addressed that I could not do in my current role. And I knew that the way I was going to get at these questions that I thought were imperative and do the work that I really wanted to do was to apply to a PhD program. So that so so I started from a place of knowing very clearly what it was I wanted to research, um, sort of in broad terms, of course, if I already knew it, it was not a PhD program. But um, so that helped. Um, and while you you do want to start writing your statement, you know, as soon as you can, you don't want to leave it to the last minute. I don't think that my statement really took its final form uh, until sort of the very end of this application process because I, the bulk of my time was spent contacting professors at different universities um, and setting up phone calls and setting up Skype calls and making sure to get them in front of me because as much as they might be feeling me out, I needed to know what are their advising styles. Um, how many other students do they have? Have they had students before? Um, you know, how were they? I'm not necessarily interested in going to look for a tenure track faculty position. Is that something they would support, or do most of their students go on to teach? Um, because all of those things will affect your experience as a PhD student and their likelihood of taking you on as a student um, because the personality and the culture have to match as well, right? Um, a handy piece of advice that I had while writing my statement. So, so I also reached out to a bunch of friends who had applied to and gotten into PhD programs, and they were also generous to share their statements so that I could see sort of this breadth of types. And they're not all the same. Everybody's is different. Um, uh, but a tip that I got that I'm not necessarily going to give to you, but I will say helped me in structuring my statement is to treat it a bit like a grant application because you have to state sort of your goals, your background knowledge, what experience you have that sets you up to do this research. And then you have to sort of explain that you're familiar with the literature in this field, right? Uh, and how you're gonna intervene into that um, and what you think is missing. Um, and that could be a very good, useful sort of bounded structure to work within. Um, it's not necessarily gonna be everybody's cup of tea and nothing you write will be at everybody's cup of tea, um, but yeah. Um, it was always the hardest part of an application to do. Uh, it's very hard to sell yourself, right? It, it's it's a little bit about selling what you know, who you are, and and uh, I, I I'm not a native speaker as well, so writing in English back then I don't know how many of you are not native speakers. So 
the, the advice that Seamus gave at the beginning is give it to as many people as you can to read it, even if you are a native speaker, is very, very important. Uh, I learned how to sell myself after so many years, right? Uh, uh, so, so I look for some structural things at the beginning. So I control F, you know, control F, find. I look for very structural things. Basically, I, I go through it once and I try to pinpoint words, terminology, knowledge, uh, if you've done your homework. And then I go back and I read it uh, carefully. And what I'm, what I'm expecting is I, I didn't save the word by doing my PhD and I have to admit it. You are not probably going to save the word, although I hope that this is going to be the case. I would like to see cohesion. I would like to see something quite specific that you have in your mind, even if, as it was said, it's not going to be the subject of your PhD. Uh, the, the part that Matt said that I also don't like to be asked to review because that's, let's say, the first test, right? If this keeps happening afterwards, it's not a good sign. Uh, you have to do your own project management and you, I would like to see that inside the research proposal. It's like, uh, it's, it's a research program. Uh, I don't like essays, long essays. I'm a technical writer, so I like short sentences and uh, a concise subset. I love AI and I love data science. By the way, I have seen this algorithm that's running there and, and, and it's saving the world. Okay, and I love data science and AI and this is going to save the world. That, that, that takes you out of, of my hypothesis. Okay. Uh, being from a technical field, I also look a little bit at the background that you have, right? Uh, that means that if you don't know math, it's not that I'm not going to take you, but uh, I'd like to see why multidisciplinarity is important for you. Why why am I here? Because I love multidisciplinarity, which means I don't expect everybody to know the best linear algebra and, and differential equations and all that stuff. That sounds scary, and it's not. But I, I do check for things that have, uh, like, that you have learned in the past and that they will be useful for, uh, for when, you do, when you do the PhD. Oh, I think I've said most of what I'm going to say about it already. Those are all those are all very valuable points. I, I will just pick up one thing from what Haley was saying. After you finish writing your statement, read it through and ask yourself the question: Do I really want to go to the University of Toronto Faculty of Information? Is the fit really right for me? Because this it is. A long, hard slog to a PhD. You might love it when you start, and you might love it when you finish, but there'll be moments of tremendous soul searching along the way. And I know that from personal experience. Oh, you, you will love to learn a lot of things about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. If I could just, yeah, just reiterate that too. I, I think we often, we can really tell. When you read your letters, we see what you're what you're up to, whether or not you really need a PhD. That question is that you said it perfectly, Haley. This idea that I knew I needed to I, there was this question that I wanted to ask, and the PhD was how I could ask it. Like that more than anything is what I look for in an application. Because if if you're doing it because uh, with a PhD behind my name, I'm gonna make more money, I'd be like, come on. Five, work in a field for five years and be making more money at the end of that period than you would starting, you know, again. That's a terrible reason to do a PhD. If it's, I really like doing research and I find the university to be a safe space for that, that's also something you can pick up on if you're like, no, that's that's not the right fit. It's got to be that you have an, an intellectual agenda, a drive, and that the PhD, and you can't satisfy that in some other way. You can't satisfy that within a research role, even in industry, maybe because the project is longer than the industry timelines for, for research. 
there's got to be something about the PhD. There's got to be a dependency there. And I mean, I, that's the. Okay. So, move on. Great. So, second last question before we open up for questions. Um, so, your favorite part about researching or teaching? <laughs> so we already mentioned interdisciplinarity, so this is a very diverse place in terms of disciplines and, and mindsets, so I really love this about this faculty, that also for my teaching but also research, I have colleagues and PhD students around me that bring always new ideas and help me shape my own research agenda. We talked about the freedom in this space, in this space of the university, you can really delve into in that, into an idea that is your idea. And even if you have a supervisor, this is there is a hierarchy of course. But you really work as very much as a peer and and and, and Perkins mentioned the, the learning from the students, so you teach us things because at some point you become the expert in that area. And, and so this is what I like, that uh, when I work in the industry, I felt the hierarchy, I felt the agenda of somebody else, so I had to do also some research and to write policies, but following the mandate of the organization or my boss. Here, if I explore policy issues, it's my way of looking at policy. So it's, uh, this, this freedom is only here. And, and this faculty is very diverse, and we are a, a, a group of people that uh, always question why we are in this faculty together, because we are so different. So like Pedipis and I, apart from being <laughs> we, we don't have much in common. We speak I don't, the same language. Yes, kind of. <laughs> we are not mother tongue English speakers. This is what makes us similar. But I don't know math. He hates what I write. But we still do. <laughs> Does he even read it? Does he read it? <laughs> oh, you did. I have read this protocol. Most of the time. Uh, uh, why do you answer that? She, yeah. yeah. Answer. So, so when you become a PhD student, you get several privileges here, right? So one of the privileges is that you get one of these forms. <laughs> so this is a form, and you can get access to the best room in this building. The best room in this building is on the fifth floor, and it has one of the most expensive coffee machines oh. in the university. <laughs> you don't get so, it with just that thought. You don't get it with just that thought, but I have to entice you somehow. Um, you need to become a student of somebody. Yeah, you have to be trained, and you have to be, uh, but if you are a student of someone, you have to get a PhD you, in coffee making. Yeah, it's a PhD in coffee making. It takes two years. Yeah, and there's two parts in the training, one regular coffee and one if you want with milk. Anyway, so, so uh, apart from that, if you speak several languages, you will probably have the chance to practice them here because you will find a ton of them. Uh, I speak like seven or eight, I don't know. Uh, so, so it's it's a multicultural, it's a multidisciplinary um, uh, place where I am a computer scientist in a non-computer science place, and I love it. I wanted to come here. When I was coming here, uh, Seamus Ross was the dean, and I was in his office, and he was gr gr grilling me in questions. And he asked me one of the most difficult technical questions that I have ever received in my life. Why do we need database normalization? And I, I left the office and I said, am I still going to do technical stuff here? Like, what is happening? So one of the things that I like is that I'm, I'm very technical, but I get to do non-technical stuff. I am very technical and I get to be, let's say, criticized about being very technical. And I, I, I say that in a, in, a, in a nice way because I'm in a field that is quite hot right now. Uh, I get to know 
uh, more disciplines, and I get to meet students about teaching from multiple disciplines. So I, it excites me every time I have an audience of students that come from architecture, biology, computer scientists, computer science, they don't want to be computer scientists, um, lawyers who don't want to become lawyers, doctors who don't want to become doctors, computer scientists who don't want to teach only computer science students. So I love that. So there is like, I had a group uh, two years ago in my data science class, uh, they were doing a project, if there is any correlation between UFO sightings and the weather patterns in the United States. Because as we all know, UFOs only appear in the United States, so, right? so nowhere else in the world. So in Greece, we don't have any UFOs. Right? So, so these, these things, uh, you don't easily see down the road in, in, in computer science. So every time I leave the class, I feel excited. Like all my worries and all my problems are out because I get to hear something something different every single day. Maybe I can say something quickly. Uh, I, so this is about favorite part, right? I don't know where else I can have a class where I ask people to read deep feminist science studies theory and simultaneously build microcontroller systems in the same class and basically screw with everybody at the same time. No, but I mean, I think what's so special about the faculty is within this world that we're, where we, where I think increasingly we believe that we have to better understand how technology and society fit together. This is a place where we actually both do technical intervention and understand those technologies in deep material ways and engage in a deep social and conceptual examination and analysis, critical analysis of those things. We do both of those things in this faculty. Some people do one side or the other, and then there's some people like me that do both. And all three of those groups, the technical, the social, and the weirdo in the middle, we're all legitimate. We're all legitimate. We're not peripheral to the faculty. We're all core to it. And I think that's a very that's an extremely rare thing. And that's by the way, if you're thinking about the faculty in relationship to other places, I think that's the, the, the most distinguishing characteristic of the faculty. Uh, sure. I will say two things. Um, one, I think the first is perhaps a bit more of a symptom of being a PhD student versus a master's student or any other sort of kind of student. Um, in that, and, and especially the faculty here, uh, I have felt very sort of taken seriously as a scholar and a professional. Um, there are so many opportunities for you to do your own work in a supportive environment with folks who are already writing and working in the industry you're interested in, and for you to, to sort of have voice, um, which I think is vital. Um, the second thing I will say is that I'm very pleased with the amount of people working in this faculty, uh, students and faculty alike, who are interested in critical methodologies and theory and thinking through <laughs> decolonial methodologies, thinking through feminist uh, methodologies, who are not sort of following the mainstream lines of thought, but are really branching off and doing some really innovative um, work uh, and thinking about marginalized communities or what have you. Um, and I think that that is not something you get everywhere either. So I think there is everything, I agree with everything that, that they all said, my colleagues and Haley have said. We have great students and you learn from them all the time. Wonderful interdisciplinarity, which is expressed in intellectual multivocality, with many different voices many different perspectives on same kinds of issues, so you have to look at things in different ways. We use a pluricity of research methods, from experimentation to empirical methods to design to hermeneutics. But the most exciting thing about being in a great faculty with great colleagues, great students, is the fact that we're embedded in an absolutely world-class university. We have the second best library in North America. 
if you're interested in an aspect of an intellectual problem that you don't have a colleague here, you want to take a philosophical angle on it, you want to work, you want to talk to someone in engineering, you want to, you want to talk to someone in, in um, social science, political science, or sociology, you want to talk to someone in history. We have great and open colleagues in other departments and other faculties who are more than willing to help you as well. In fact, an increasing number of our students, while they have their lead supervisor here and one other member of their committee from either, drawn either from faculty, the graduate faculty here at St. George campus or from Mississauga or from um, Scarborough, they also bring in a faculty member from elsewhere in the university to be, a, to be the third member of that committee. It creates a, an intellectual robustness that you just don't get at, at many other institutions. It, it really works well for everyone. Okay, last question. So we've talked a lot, given a lot of great advice, but what is your, to summarize, like your top piece of advice that you'd like to provide the students or One word, one word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First sentence. Be brave. Brave. Okay. <laughs> I'll say two. I have the next advantage. I'm the only one in the panel with a PhD from USD. So I felt how it is to be a, I mean, a graduated PhD. So uh, you will not realize where you are until you finish. I did realize where I was studying right after I finished, honestly. But what Shane said, top university in the world, you don't feel it when you study because you're happy at the beginning, you're happy at the end, but in between, you would hate and love your supervisor. Okay? So um, <laughs> be honest and make it your life. Your university and the PhD is going to give you your life back to the maximum. My word is enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the journey. Despite all the ups and downs. My word is self care. <laughs> <laughs> and sleep. <laughs> and I guess I have to have three words grasp the opportunity. It really, when you're here, this is, as Matt or Herbie's pointed out, this is a one time event four to five year period when all you're going to do is learn, think, and research. That is a very, very unique opportunity. I've never been able to repeat that, even on sabbatical leave, or it's just not the same. It's a, it's a once in a lifetime chance. So, Shiva might have some questions from the yeah. audience. So, we have like 12, like 13 now attendees watching us live from right. around the world. So I have some questions here. The first question is, I have a publication from my master's degree, but it's over 10,000 words. Should I submit a portion of it or the whole thing? It's more like an admissions question. Maybe? It's more than a meat question. <laughs> they can submit the whole thing. Submit the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> and the next. <laughs> All but the conclusion. No. Leave out your live section. Go ahead, Okay, and the next question is, when looking at the research statement for a good fit with the high school, how much do you take into account the intention of the student to participate in interdisciplinary programs like the book history and print culture? I mean, I, I guess I'd, I'd say that it, there's two things that are good about that. One is that it shows that the student has paid attention to the opportunities that are present here at the University of Toronto in collaborative specializations like book history. Um, and in the other, uh, we have faculty members that are strong participants of that program, the back one in particular. So I can't see any, I think it's always going to be a benefit if you speak to the specificity of the program and our connections to those kinds of things. And we have a book library. Visual library. Yeah. So lots of resources. Yeah. Yeah. For that example, but I think any reference to collaborative specializations that the faculty participates in is probably a good thing. Thank you. So if I get more questions, I'll just ask them at the end. Yeah. 
uh, can I just ask, like, if someone is asking a question, be loud, or if you can just please repeat the question so people online can also hear it. Um, one thing I didn't hear in terms of advice, and one thing I've been doing, so maybe I've been wasting my time. Well, based on the user experience, it probably happened, is looking through T-Space to read some of the, at least the introductions to publish, or the, the thesis of your students who graduated their doctorates to see what did they write about? Uh, what did the project end up being? And it's so interesting to read the acknowledgement section. Because I think you see the journey there a lot. That's, that's there are some, yeah. some of them don't put the acknowledge yes. publicly out. Yes, I don't have my public yet. And um, but is it, that's a great, 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 great idea. idea. I love that idea. idea. And I wondered if did, do any of you keep a list of bibliography of, of the published thesis of your of the students you supervise? Because TSpace is kind of it's publicly contributed. You know, the people pick the tags, they pick the subject headings for their. Thing. So you know, if you look under information, it was a little I, a capital I. I think you get where I'm going. You mean, is there any way to sort on all of the theses of faculty of information PhD students? You would think that would be easier. But it's not possible. You have to do it. You have to do it by domain area. Yeah, you go. You can go by doctoral thesis, and then you can browse for keywords. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, I would have thought you could. Maybe, the faculty of information would be a search term or something. Maybe you can. Maybe I'll I don't know. I, uh, so, so, you can look under faculty of information as well, but then you can't now by doctoral thesis. No. You can do one. What are the other? So that, that's a great question. Um, Professor Dan Ryan, in the back, actually said to us, why don't we have a list of where our students went to? Yeah, cool. So that's what we had. That we produced that table here. And we actually have a list. I think we should go back now and produce an online list of PhD theses by year that were completed. It points to the so the T space it points right? to the T space yeah, yeah. resource, so the so the students can do just what you you suggest. Yeah. That's a very that's a great great idea. Uh, I I would say some other students that I've, I've talked to have done something like that, but with the faculty members. Yeah. So oh, I what I what I uh, find interesting about that is you know I don't know how it can be very. <laughs> long time ago, right? So I don't know how relevant that is, but I think the students these days are actually more relevant for getting a sense of what the program is doing. It's a great idea. I also consider it as part of, of your homework a little bit. So in the technical field, there are two, three specific places where you can find everything about technical publications. So my publications are not curated by myself, right? So there are two, three resources where people who want to do research in the technical field, they should know where to go and find my publications, right? And we all knew when we were PhD students, oh, these three publications are with this, three, with, with this student. These other three publications are with another student. So it, it, it depends a little bit on the discipline. It's a great idea. I, I, it would have helped me a lot. But I also consider it as a little bit of, because it defines different themes, and maybe depending on the discipline, where like we publish in conferences, and then we take the papers together and we put them in a, in a thesis. There, there's in, in technical fields, there's nothing like, oh, I'm in the first chapter, oh, I'm in the second chapter. This doesn't exist. So it's more important to target conferences and to write in conferences and then stitch them all together, and that's your thesis. So it is, it, it depends a little bit on the discipline, but yeah. I'm glad you asked this because I'm going to say, I am kicking myself around the before, but I spent sort of a lot of time talking to faculty members, but I spent an equal amount of time talking to current students, especially students who are working with the people that I wanted to work with, um, because you get an idea of sort of what topics they're working on and sort of how your topic might fit, but also they just have so much information that you don't get anywhere else about what it's like to be a student of your particular advisor or in that department. Um, and I really, like, if someone were to email me, for instance, and ask me questions, I would be so happy to have that conversation with you. And I think that that's the case for most other current students. Um, and and it's an asset for both of you, right, to know who's working on what under your advisors so that you can work together. More I have a question here. This, uh, someone is asking. I wish we you had more PhD students in the panel, so we just want to acknowledge that it was a very busy time for them. But his question is, what is the culture like among the students, and how do faculty relate to students? So maybe we can take this question. 
So I think I'm a bit of an, it, it, it's interesting that I'm the one answering this question because my cohort this year is 20 students. Uh, it's the biggest it's ever been, if I understand correctly. Right, yeah. um, and I, I can't speak to whether or not it's going to continue to be that much. Uh, if you were to come in next year, probably not. No, definitively. Um, so, so that's an interesting dynamic, right? Uh, that there's 20 of you, and so it's. But, but something that we did, at least in my cohort, we have we have a Slack that we all talk to each other on. We're all, every one of us, in conversation every single day. Um, we share so many resources, so many calls for proposals, conference calls. Um, uh, so, so personally, in my experience, it's been really incredible. It's been a really collaborative group environment. Um, and, and support from the faculty members that I engage with most days uh, has been equally great. Um, I think you get out of it what you put into it. So if you're not, if you are the, you got to come into it and make those connections. Um, and maybe go a little out of your comfort zone, perhaps, to be uh, proactive on, on making those connections and keeping in contact with people, because it is so easy to like find yourself in isolation and never speak to someone and just be in your office all day. Um, but like for your own mental health and for your good, get out and make those connections with people. And I found it really easy to do that here. Can you the name of the time? <laughs> so, here. I'm just going to add, add a point and pick up on a point that David was making. Last year, we admitted more <coughs> students to our PhD program. We did that because we didn't know what impact Doug Ford would have on education in Ontario. We were under the impression that there was going to be a continued expansion of our of doctoral, the doctoral numbers that we were allocated here in the faculty. And we have some 50 faculty members between faculty and faculty of information, faculty who have called their graduate home at the faculty of information who are based in Mississauga at UTM, or faculty who are based at Scarborough. And every one of those faculty members wants to have one or two PhD students at a time. So we actually have room for significant expansion in student numbers. But unfortunately, the caps that the government has put on student numbers, the province has put on student numbers this year, means that we only have 10 places. Last year, there was a one in 10 chance of getting Um, it just because we don't have, um, the government just hasn't allocated us additional places. So I think um, we will have a oh, there um, This is a question for both the admins mm -hmm. and also the faculty. Uh, is part-time students something common that you guys uh, receive? We do not take part-time students anymore. Okay. We used to have a flex time program. We have suspended it, um, and we will look at it again in a couple of years. But uh, we do not take we do not take part time students now. We have taken the decision for it to be a full time program. It's a very it was a very rare to, to be yes. to champ, It was a very rare circumstance that part time students were successful. It, yeah, there, there is a small subset that would be. They were mainly senior senior citizens, actually, in a way, or very senior people that needed or wanted to engage in something while their columns were retired. Uh, but for most people, it was unsuccessful, and that's over a long period of time. So, one last. Yeah. So one last question from online: Is there a possibility for international research projects? Most of us engage most. in research across national boundaries. I have projects in. Uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, plus Switzerland, Switzerland, Switzerland yeah. uh, Vienna, Germany, Germany, Austria. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you've got projects still running out in, uh, in Europe. In Europe, yeah. So, because I know lots of people don't like to ask questions, and uh, when they're part of a group, I want to now so that we all have 
the 20 minute chance for you to talk to either Pericles, Fiorella, Matt Ratto, Haley, Bryant, Dan Ryan is in the back, or Shiva, uh, Sherry Danlin, or Christine Chan. Um, and we'll be here for the next 30, 40 minutes for our, for our long, you're here. We're more than happy to answer your questions. Um, and most importantly, after you leave here, if you have a question, you can email anybody, you can email me, and I will come back to you. Um, if it's a candidate, Mike can answer it, I'll pass it on to someone else who can. Okay? Great. Thank, Thank you. Writing samples to show I have ability to write like, 